Crowd Scene. Hi there. Hello. Welcome to Crowd Scene, the show about successful crowdfunding campaigns and the people who make them happen. I'm Michael Ogden. And I'm Peter Dean. We've got a fun show for you this episode. As featured in Fast Company Magazine, our guests are two best friends who started a peanut butter company to combat malnutrition in developing countries. It's an inspiring story with some unexpected twists, including a road trip across America and an exploding Winnebago. They'll share their story of their great success on Indiegogo, and we have crowdfunding expert Chris Day back for more as our special guest. That's all coming up in just a few minutes, but first, a quick look at the news. Mike, if I said the name... Andy Murray to you. What would yes. you think? What would you think? I would think uh, Murray Mound. I would think Wimbledon tennis. I would think Scottish uh, champion. Anything else? I would say he just had a baby. Um, yeah, good one. Okay, with his wife. Anything else? Davis Cup. I think he did pretty well there. Yeah, uh, there's a uh, patchy beard. Maybe we could throw in there. Okay, patchy beard. Well, yes. see this impressive list of he, attributes. He's a fighter, a real fighter. And that. We can also add the word crowdfunding now. What? Uh, because it turns out that uh, Andy Murray obviously makes a colossal amount of money playing tennis. In fact, he's number six in the world in terms of how much uh, tennis players make, mm. which is a lot, right? Yes. So why does he need crowdfunding? This well, he's not like crowdfunding he's... anything himself, but uh, it turns out he's been pouring some of his not inconsiderable wealth into crowdfunding. Into a new platform. Is he's creating a new platform around tennis rackets and uh, no balls? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, balls. Uh, no, he's not. He's not doing anything like that. Um, he is putting some money into equity crowdfunding platform Cedars. Uh, he is investing an undisclosed sum, which is uh, journo speak for lots and lots of money. Mm. Uh, into a whole range of British companies, including uh, one called Oppo Ice Cream, Commuter Club, and Land Bay. So why is he doing this? Andy Murray's PR people have the following to say. Giving recognition and support to British entrepreneurs is important to me, especially those who are the driving force behind growth-focused businesses. That sounds like something he'd say, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm not sure I, I can imagine him saying growth-focused businesses. businesses. Like, exactly. No. He's, never, he's never, ever put those words together. I think what, what's happening here, though, is he's throwing down the gauntlet. He, we want to see John McEnroe, uh, Bjorn Borg, uh, Pete Sampras. These are the tennis Federer, players of Mike's generation, listeners. <laughs> Andre, Andre Agassi. Fred Perry. <laughs> These guys. All right. Andy Murray's showing the way. Let's see. You. Oh, Djokovic. Come on, man. You, Time to get you, off the court and now, into Mike? crowdfunding. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's he's a, he's a pioneer, Andy Murray. Good luck to yeah, you, man. Yeah, good for you, Andy Murray. Um, I take back everything I said about the patchy beard. It's a full fine beard you have, sir. I see the angle here, Pete. Uh, this is Andy Murray's considerable effort uh, to get on this show um, as a guest, uh, so that he can discuss his crowdfunding experiences and adventures with uh, with the two of us. I imagine that's what it is. Good plan, Andy. But don't you wish you could make a living playing tennis all day long? You got to play like eight hours a day. What it's an not... easy life, you know, knocking balls over the net all day long. I think your vision of this is is uh, not probably I anywhere wish, near reality. I wish I could do that. I mean, uh, to be honest, I probably wouldn't be in the top 10 if I did. But I mean, yeah, I'm You'd guessing I wouldn't be far off. Top 10 continents, yes. <laughs> top 10 continents. Um, actually, every time I've played you, you've won, which is slightly irritating. Yeah, I'm a hustler. I, I, there's no ball that gets past me. Um, although I did beat you at table tennis the other day. Several balls got past you then. Mm, yes. Well, maybe you could uh, parlay that into a career um, uh, and uh, make your millions and then start crowdfunding uh, just like Andy Murray does. Yeah, balls. If you've got a crowdfunding news item you'd like to share, write to us at hello at crowdsceneshow.com. Thanks. In this episode, we're joined from Nashville, Tennessee by Alex Cox and Mark Slegel, co-founders of Good Spread Peanut Butter. Back in 2011, they were inspired to help address malnutrition in developing countries, and their solution was unusual. But as we'll hear from Alex and Mark, it hasn't all been plain sailing or smooth spreading. They've had their fair share of crunchy bits along the way. <laughs> They launched a crowdfunding campaign to get their business off the ground, and for every sale of their own peanut butter, they gave an equivalent amount of life-saving therapeutic food to a malnourished child. 
Alex and Mark set out to raise $65,000 on Indiegogo, and by the end of their campaign, 599 backers took the total up to about $70,000. So let's find out how they did it. Alex Cox and Mark Slagle, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Thank you. Great to have you here. Alex and Mark, thanks for being here. Uh, Let's set the scene. For our listeners who aren't familiar with Good Spread Peanut Butter, what's the reason uh, that you two got into this? So the one reason that that Mark and I got into this whole thing in the first place is we used to work for a therapeutic food producer and we, we kind of learned that whole process. And, and just to relieve anyone's concerns out there, it's not something that we brewed up in our kitchen. Some, some scientists brought together by UNICEF actually developed UNICEF and doctors without borders developed this kind of superfood that would replace milk formula. And the way they figured it out was a way you could you could get this milk formula to a child without mixing it in water was to put it in peanut paste. Mm-hmm. So they came up with these little sachets of peanut butter, milk, and vitamin. And these can go anywhere in the world. They don't need refrigeration. They can last up to two years, even more. And the thing about a severely malnourished child is um, it's it's a really specific target. Those are kids in the first 1,000 days of their lives, and that's when our brains are developing rapidly. So so they can actually overcome severe malnutrition. It's it's considered a disease by NGOs, so um, by by nurses. So they'll, they'll administer this to children who need it, and they actually overcome severe malnutrition between four and six weeks on this treatment. So, so the best way to think of it is more like a vaccine. This is a, it's like a vaccine against severe malnutrition. Mm. And once, once they're on the other side of it, it's done. They're on the other side of it. They can get hungry again. They can get malnourished again, but their brain and their immune system will be developed. And so within that thousand days, that's the crucial part is with the peanut butter sachets, um, how long would a malnourished child have to be on that, that program before they come out to the other side? Yeah. So it's, it's usually about three per three of those sachets per day. Okay. Um, and the average is four weeks. Sometimes it's six weeks. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty quick. It's a pretty, a quick turnaround when you see these kids who are, you know, essentially they're withering away. Mm. And then on the end of this treatment, after a month, they're like a regular plumpy baby. That's incredible. And so you mentioned Alex, that, uh, this was developed by, with UNICEF and how did, how did you and Mark get involved with this project? Well, I'll let Mark tell that part of the story. <laughs> Well, we, we actually, when we first heard about that, that story that Alex just told, we thought it was miraculous because we, you know, we just, we just saw like this magical peanut butter that was basically saving the lives of these kids. And we had both had a mentor, a guy in the U S named Mark Moore, Mm -hmm. who started a, he, he was over in Africa for about 11 years, uh, in Uganda doing some, some work there. And came back to the U S to work in DC. And that's where he heard a UNICEF, uh, representative speaking about this need for therapeutic food. When Mark Moore heard about this, he set out to start producing this medicine for children here in the U S and he went down to what is known here as to uh, to Alex and I, it's a peanut paradise, but Mm -hmm. Southern Georgia, Mm -hmm. there's peanuts everywhere. And it's the, uh, it's one of the biggest producers in the world of peanuts. And Mark Moore went down there and started a an, a an organization called MANA, which stands for Mother Administered Nutritive Aid. Mm-hmm. So their mission was to take all these peanuts, add in the milk and vitamins, and uh, send work with UNICEF, USAID, and aid groups all around the world to get this to kids. So Alex and I um, were recruited by Mark and the MANA team. Alex was over in China um, working. And I was actually in Greece doing some school there. And we came back to the U.S., came to the metropolis of of Fitzgerald, Georgia. And we worked with Mark on trying to get our our kind of mission was let's try to get this story about this about this therapeutic peanut butter out to more people because it's a fairly, you know, unknown kind of effort. Um, Not a lot of people were aware of it, especially not aware of how effective it was. And Alex and I just thought if more people knew about this, if more, you know, college students knew about it, if more uh, high schools and churches and community groups knew about it, if it had a a kind of a larger social profile, then, uh, you know, essentially we could do a lot more good. It just didn't really have any attention. 
And when you first got the call, though, uh, from Europe to in Greece and in China, and your mentor called you up, I mean, was this uh, a news for you or a new issue for you? Was this something that he was introducing to you, or is this something that you were familiar with for a long time? We were fairly unfamiliar with it, I would say, Alex, but we knew Mark, so we knew he had kind of been on this journey. But um, we were learning. We were definitely getting baptized into the world of uh, the aid world and this this therapeutic peanut butter concept. So is there something fairly new that he saw in, the, in each of you that uh, that he thought you could bring to the table? Was it your ability to to uh, evangelize and tell a story? I would say yes, but add in here, I'd also say it might have had something to do with the ability to navigate a 1971 Winnebago, <laughs> which comes into play later. Yeah, and I, I think I think part of it was he just wanted two unattached guys who he thought would be down <laughs> to to take on. A somewhat dangerous task. Yeah. It was the beginning of a great adventure. Did it start? That's right. I mean, you mentioned the Winnebago. So you came back to America and the idea, as you said, was to um, spread the word uh, amongst college students in particular. Is that right? That's correct. And so you hit the road. We hit the road. Actually, the first thing, Alex, do you remember? I feel like one of the first things we did, we met with Mark. We got the Winnebago, which had shag carpet, an eight track player. We've, we've got to tell you more about that. Um, <laughs> but the first thing we did, Alex, I think, was we shaved the nastiest mustaches to fit. Uh, if we were going to live in Winnebago, we thought we needed to look the part. Um, so we, that was a very, like, bonding experience. I and, feel like we both had pretty burly beards. And, and and keep in mind, this is back, this is a few years ago, and mustaches were kind of at their peak cool. <laughs> so... <laughs> well, we would encourage every listener out there uh, right now to check out your videos. I mean, they're they are they're terrific. I mean, and also you can feel kind of the uh, the friendship between the two of you, um, and the, and it looks like uh, you know the fun that you're having. I mean, are you two? Did you guys grow up together, or are you old friends? No, actually, we met in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the journey started. We met um, probably like eight, eight or nine days before we hit the road. Yeah. Um, and, and let me kind of preface the Winnebago rationale too. We, you know, to us, this was a really good news story. Like this was everything Alex and I had kind of grown up and, and tried to be a part of was in a lot of ways felt really guilt driven, you know, like <sighs> save this dying child's life. And, you know, there's a fly on the face and it was really sad. Um, and that's, that's one method, I guess, to encourage action. But we saw, all the positive impacts and this kind of good news story with malnutrition that there was this cure now. So we, with, with Mark Moore um, from Mana thought getting in a Winnebago um, and kind of going on this peanut butter crusade around the U S would be something positive. The thing that really, the kids really, really need to get is the milk. So that the powdered milk is what's most important in this formula and what works, what's amazing because they really need their mom's milk. Unfortunately, with a lot of these kids, their mom's milk is also doesn't have the nutrients that it needs. Mm. So it's a scary cycle. And so that's why this intervention of a, of a therapeutic food or of a powdered milk is so important. And in the 70s and 80s, doctors were using just a powdered milk, but it was causing a lot of problems. It was a formula, F100, uh, and it was causing a lot of problems because in the developing world, there wasn't... Um, there wasn't an easy way to know how much water to add or to measure. And the water issues with, uh, with dirty water was really causing a lot of problems too. So that's kind of what started this need to have something that could last longer, wasn't as hard to use in the field. And peanut butter was, uh, was, was really brilliant because when you mix that milk and the peanut butter, you, you actually get a complete protein. So it's, it works on, in more ways than one. I mean, it's a simple ingredients, but it really is a profound product. So, you guys didn't really know each other. Uh, you were both <laughs> recruited by this uh, Mark Moore who, who ran Manor. You were given an ancient Winnebago in <laughs> North Carolina and told to drive across the country, mm. spreading the word. So what happened next? So Mark Moore from the Manor team uh, asked Alex and I to come to Charlotte, North Carolina. And when we got there, we were tasked with a mission to go around the U.S. spreading the good news about Manor and about ready-to-use therapeutic food. Um, so we did what we thought was a natural progression, which was buy a 1971 Winnebago, and it had shag carpet, <laughs> yeah, of course. an eight-track player, right? I mean, to us, it was all about, this is a good news story, so let's have something positive that's memorable that can show up on a college campus mm. and give us a platform uh, to teach people about therapeutic food. We actually had a big tent on the top 
that we would set up like a mock therapeutic feeding center that you would see uh, in Africa or in South America. Mm -hmm. So it was really um, a great experience for the students. We drove it all across the country. It broke down, you know, all the time. Um, we had, we spent a lot of time in mechanic shops and, you know, risked our lives and the lives of anyone who tried to pass us on either side because we could barely <laughs> keep it between the lines. <laughs> but, um, but this Winnebago, I mean, it was acting as a conversation starter along the way. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to forget that thing, especially when it was like driving across the front lawn right by your dorm, mm. you know, and smoke was going up behind it. It was, it was very, very memorable. Can I ask you, what, yep. what was the go-to eight-track uh, tape? What was the song that, let's play that? Oh, man, that, it's got to be, I mean, the, the song of our whole trip was was The Glory of Love by Peter Cetera. <laughs> <laughs> I know that song. I mean, we, we had that, I don't know, that must have like two or three songs from the Karate Kid Part Two soundtrack on, <laughs> on an eight track, so that was underrated that really, classic. That really that that really lifted us up when we were down. And this is prior to crowdfunding, is that right? Yes, this is yeah. this is all leading up. Sorry, I feel like we're taking a while to get to the crowdfunding, but this is all really important because it 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 builds into the story of why we how we got into crowdfunding and and what happens next. Mm. Yeah, so Alex and I had made it all the way across the country. Uh, to Malibu, um, we were doing some events in LA, and we were we were doing a, an event at Pepperdine University in Malibu. And uh, and you've been after, on the road for how long at this point? It was it was it was right around two months at that point. Okay, yeah, right. No one had died yet or anything like that. <laughs> uh, so the were you the getting PCH sick of peanut butter state, though? Was there a moment where you're like, Ugh. no, okay, no, no. <laughs> That's actually impossible. That's blasphemy. <laughs> Sorry, man. <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so we made it all the way across the U S from North Carolina to California. And after what seemed to be a routine brake checkup, um, because the brakes weren't working very well by the end of it, uh, we were driving down along the PCH on the coast outside of Malibu and heard what sounded like a gunshot go off in the back. <laughs> And when we, we, you know, that was not a normal sound for the Winnebago to make, um, though it did make some strange sounds. We got out and saw a small fire coming out of the back, which also was not a normal thing to see. Um, nice. Yeah, not typical. So after panicking, we were able to get a park ranger to come over with a fire extinguisher and put it out. But the flame was not done. And it came back with a vengeance. And Alex and I, you know, in a panic uh, we're running back and forth with trash cans, dumping water on it. And the fire grew and grew uh, because shag carpet is like extremely flammable, <laughs> yeah. I guess. And all of the eight tracks that we have. Oh, the um, eight tracks. And the peanut the butter. The eight tracks. And the peanut, you know, believe it or not, Pete, the peanut butter is not flammable. We've tested this mm. um, in our second Indiegogo campaign. <laughs> you we tested it some, on that some, day. Some, yeah. Some lab <laughs> tests. We tested it that day. Yeah. So, um, there, you know, the, the kicker with this 1971 Winnebago is that there were two large propane tanks in the back that ran all of the power and uh, the, like the kitchen and uh-huh. the bat, you know, that kind of stuff. And those are even more flammable than the shag carpet. So by the time the fire department got there, we saw the thing go up in an Hollywood style explosion, um, <laughs> it's probably 30 or 40 feet wow. in the air. Huh. Wow. Um, A fireball. And, it was a fireball. Yeah, it could have been seen from space, I'm sure, that night. <laughs> and after after about 20 minutes, there was literally no, – it was ashes. Oh, it was all to the ground. So we, we collected a, a, a Ziploc bag full of Manabago ashes and continued on our journey. <laughs> and did you feel that you'd lost a, lost a buddy? I mean, you'd been traveling with the Winnebago for a few months by that point. I mean, it was, it was our spirit animal. I mean, we still to this day, you know, dread that, that loss. And you still have the ashes? We still, we, we we had the ashes and someone sent us an urn uh, to put the ashes in. So we don't know. I I assume this is a used urn. Um, I don't know. Is there much of a market for secondhand urns? I I, I get, I don't know. We, We have it though. We take it with us. We're almost wherever we go. So the, the spirit of the Winnebago is, is with us every day. And, and one day we will, we will, you know, get back on the saddle. Yeah. Again. And, uh, and purchase some more eight track tapes. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. You know, what's sad about that? This is the side, but all along the way, people donated us eight tracks. I mean, that was like a thing is like we would show up and, and you would see these 
you know, these like 40 or 50 year old men, their eyes just light up as they remembered this this era of Winnebago's and they would go into their house. They'd say, I'll be right back. They'd go in their house and they'd come back out with a box of eight track. And I remember there was one guy in particular who just said, he just handed it to us and he just said, I want you to enjoy these now. Wow. And it was this very like- With a tear funny. in his eye. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had to call him and tell him that they all burned to the ground, <laughs> but um, yeah. we enjoyed them while they lasted. There were some tears and some shock. Um, but you know, the, the, the spirit lives on. And I love that it didn't <laughs> stop you. It was the, yeah. the end of one chapter and the opening of another. Exactly. The, the, mm-hmm. the, the Phoenix rising from the ashes. Yeah. When they make I a like movie about it. this, uh, you're, you're, you guys, that's, <laughs> it's just going to play so well. They're going to spend right. 50 million on the, uh, on the, <laughs> the fireball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute with more Alex and Mark, but first a short break as our pal Chris Day pays us a visit. Let's go over to the weird world of crowdfunding with crowdfunding expert, Chris Day. Uh, hi, guys. Good to be back. Great Good to have, have you, Chris. Thanks Great. for coming back. All right, don't kill yourselves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts are you this week, Chris? Uh, this week, Mike and Pete, I'm in Paris. France. Ah, let, let Paris, Texas. Paris, France. No, Paris, Hilton. Ah. Nice. Ah. Ka-ching. Gold. <laughs> Delightful. What brings you to uh, Paris, France, Chris? Uh, Paris is, um, is I, I like to think of it as the city of love. And so um, I'm basically just wandering around looking very lonely and hoping to get a hug. Chris, do you know what crowdfunding is in French? <laughs> les, uh, les complets de les, uh, les oignons. No, I don't. No. Um, <laughs> um, I think you're close. Let's, let's, let's just go with that. I think un uh, mélange d'argent. Dans un, oui, bien sûr. Oui, mélange, oui. Ou euh, le crowdfunding. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, also, uh, what I said. What's yes. the subject uh, this week, Chris? Well, what, uh... I, 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 t- I took my um, inspiration from your guests, who um, were uh, very much uh, food focus. Yes, the Good and, Spread uh, Boys. Uh, exactly. So I, I thought I'd look at food. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm going to go into the good old-fashioned three-way situation here where I'm going to offer you three projects and you have to spot which one I've made up. A classic very crowdfunding much, three-way. I like to call it yeah. ménage à toi. And as I understand, Mike is currently in the series leading Pete one to zero. Yeah, that is correct. Is, Thanks. Did, yes, I remember same, yeah. correctly. Okay. So, I'm wearing the medal this week right now. Uh, so, so this is very much the um, the second instalment and a chance for Pete to uh, literally draw level. Yes, I'm pumped, Chris. Let's do it. Okay. Um, steady on. So here are the three um, food-based projects we've got this week. Um, and as before, I've replaced the names of the actual projects so that uh, they're almost indecipherable. The first one is called Golden Hats. Okay, Golden Hats. So Golden Hats um, is an egg-based product inspired by the centrifugal dynamics of a classic Victorian toy. Golden Hats pledges to scramble your selected egg before it's even cooked, which sounds crazy uh, because it is. You just get a yellow egg, but that is a different colour to normal eggs, so that's quite exciting. (laughs) Is there a need for such a device? I don't know. Um, I mean, sort of. I mean, it gives you a different coloured egg. You, I mean, how many white eggs have you had in your life? It's, it's pretty boring. Um, I mean, imagine if there was only one colour of potato. Um, <laughs> that would just be insane. You're I've describing never... a world I don't want to live in. <laughs> that was I, more. I've never heard Chris say the word centrifugal, so I think that's a clue. I've never heard him say the word <laughs> potato. <laughs> and did he earlier? Did he say the, that he was that this was dedicated to pledging or what? It was pledging the pleasure of eggs. What was he saying? Um, Golden Hat pledges to scramble your selected egg. Oh, I didn't okay. actually talk about pleasure eggs. I thought it was pleasuring eggs. Okay. No, no. So product number one is Golden Hats, which pre-scrambles an egg. Exactly, yeah. An egg pre-scrambler. It sounds like a hit. It does, doesn't it? But mm. let's not stop there because there's more. Okay, so the second, number two. The second um, project we've got here is simply called Potato. Um, and so you've got to imagine the word potato but with art instead of tat. Uh, so it's very different. And so this is, uh, this is basically a small book. It's a compre- comprehensive guide to creating your own potato-based art. Ah. And it's designed to improve your potato carving skills, giving you a mm-hmm. guide to creating celebrity look-alike legumes. In this book, can you see celebrity legumes like uh, designs, say, Val Kilmer? Um, Val Kilmer uh, doesn't actually make the cut uh, because he does basically look like a potato anyway. It's mostly um, Lady Gaga, um, Lord Goo Goo and the Misfits. 
So all the all the big names, really. Kids the, will love this. Exactly. Well, it's it, it is designed to encourage kids to enjoy the wonders of root, root vegetables. That's one of the big sort of slogans for this campaign. I'm amazed I haven't read about this. This sounds um, sounds big. It, mm. it, it sounds important. It, Ambitious. <laughs> it's, it's huge. It's important, and it's very, very much a real thing. Yes, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I like about that one. What's number three? <laughs> so number three is a little thing called lard bubbles. <laughs> lard bubbles. Um, I don't think that's treading on any toes in the copyright world. So no, lard-, lard bubbles is the name of a popular chocolate bar in oh. South Korea. Oh. Ah. It's Who also knew? an Who American knew? cartoon series that I grew up loving. Uh, no, the lard bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, Saturday morning cartoons. Larry yeah. Lard uh, it's also a German manufacturer of hair dryers. Uh, it's um, an Italian ice cream. It's a gelato. Exactly. Um, so it is one of the most uh, popular words in the uh, international language of, of, of love and commerce. Um, it's also an, in a, it's an expression of joy in Australia. Lard bubbles. <laughs> lard, lard bubbles. That is lard so bubbles. So lard bubbles. If you really love something. Lard bubbles. Oh, mate, you got a real lard bubble car there. <laughs> So lard bubbles, it's basically um, soap made out of meat. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of it, really. <laughs> L- the lard Wait, bubbles. So, so you can wash your hands with meat? Uh, exactly, yeah. It's made from excess meat fat. The lard bubbles um, manifesto states that um, we think everyone should smell like meat. So they want everyone to smell like meat. That's a real mission. That's the plan. Mission. Chris, what would you say the benefit is to smelling like meat? Um, I'd say if you want to make friends with the local um, uh, pets and um, be chased around the block, that's quite good. Yeah, good um, point. Thank you. Um, and also some people smell far worse than meat, so it's, uh, you can only improve. But, okay, um, so one of these is a fake. Yeah, so is it golden hats, is it potato, or is it lard bubbles? Well, I think you've made it surprisingly difficult. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's shocking, isn't it? My first reaction is, of course, that uh, all three are made up. But uh, I do trust you, Chris. You are an expert in crowdfunding, after all. I am. So I'm going to go with, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm between potato and lard bubbles, if I'm honest, uh, as always in my <laughs> yes, life. This, this sums you up, isn't it? <laughs> Chapter three of the pizza. It's a real metaphor. metaphor. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go with lard bubbles, I think. Who, who actually wants to smell of meat? Exactly. Well, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, then I will uh, take the uh, the other. I think Golden Hat is clearly a, a, a real thing. So I think the fake E this week is potato. And obviously, if I win this, then I'm going to use the expression of joy that Australians use. Of course you are. <laughs> well, Mike and Pete, um, the actual answer to the question, which of these is a fake thing, is... Potato. Ah. Yeah, oh. Ah, lard bubbles. That's Absolute it. lard bubbles. Knocked it out of the park, mate. <laughs> I feel great. That's yeah, great. Well, you must feel incredible, Mike. 2-0. The powers of crowdfunding perception are unrivaled on this I show. I can really sniff it out. <laughs> That's just me and the, my uh, meat-based soap, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, giving us your time while you're there in Paris, France. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. Well, as they say in France, yes. Um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chris. As ever, it's been... Weird. God bless you. Got a weird crowdfunding story? Have Chris comment on it by sending us a quick email at hello at crowdsceneshow.com or a tweet at crowdsceneshow. Okay, and now back to our interview with Alex and Mark of Good Spread. For us, you know, this this whole journey, if, if it had just been a friendship, you know, road trip story, you know, we might have kept going, but what really drove us and what really drove the people that we were meeting with uh, to help and lend a hand was a story of of manna and of therapeutic food and therapeutic peanut butter and the mal- malnutrition story around the world. So mm-hmm. I would say that's what really kept us going and gave us a, a larger purpose, you know, to our, our trip. It wasn't just some glorified road trip. You know, we really had a, a story that we were trying to tell. You know, it's it's frightening to to pick up hitchhikers. I know that's the common thing, but it's really scary to be a hitchhiker with you know, a mustache and, you know, have ashes. And of a urn. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, you're sending out danger signals. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, our, actually the, the end of the journey was supposed to end at this big party in Houston, um, Texas. That was kind of the final stop. And they were expecting us in the Winnebago to set up this big booth and, you know, bring, we we're going to bring all these people. And we just, we literally walked up to the party um, and they kind of were like, is, is, is this it? With an urn. And 
Yeah, and we <laughs> we we had to quickly explain ourselves, but I just don't think it translated well that uh, our Winnebago had caught on fire and and burned to the ground. That left us with this kind of this kind of season of what do we do next, or is this the end? I guess is maybe a better question that we kind of had to wrestle with. And at that point, that was when crowdfunding appeared on the horizon. Yes, yes. And crowdfunding was a, 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 a device or a tool for us. The, the real seed that had been planted was that whole time while we were hitchhiking, we, we kind of had, you know, very much inspired by these other, you know, social enterprise business models. We thought we can't hitchhike around the U.S. or even drive a Winnebago around uh, for the rest of our lives in this traditional nonprofit model where we just ask for donations mm -hmm. or maybe sell some T-shirts or whatever. But um, if we could create a product that people could interact with every day, um, that they got some benefit out of, that within the business model also helped provide this therapeutic peanut butter to kids around the world, then that's something that could grow exponentially mm -hmm. and could help, you know, that many more kids, uh, way more than we could ever do driving around um, in our Winnebago. So that's what really inspired this kind of moment of, of starting a business. Um, another, just another thing that Alex and I had zero experience in doing, um, <laughs> and, and that, yeah, that, that concept floated around for a few months. We, we actually kind of both went our separate ways for a little bit. Of course we, you know, hmm. we were, there were no hard feelings, but we kind of took some time off to think through it. Yeah. And the hope was that someone smarter than us, uh, with, a, with an MBA would come and take this idea and, and, and take it and run. But, um, the longer we waited, uh, the fewer people were interested actually, no one was ever interested in uh, in taking on the idea, so it fell back in our laps. It's interesting too that your definition of success, you know, de it evolved on that trip, which was at first it was yes. you know spreading the word and and selling some shirts, but then it became there's an opportunity to do something more here. Yes, very much so. I think we saw our ability not not Alex and I particularly, but our our kind of generation's ability to actually have an impact with a product like therapeutic food. Uh, it's very tangible. So you know exactly how many of these um, these packets are going to these kids. And we've seen the network of uh, health departments and hospitals, you know, treating it's it's considered a vaccine or a medicine. It's a pharmaceutical once it leaves the U.S. So knowing how tangible that was and knowing how we could have a direct impact really meant a lot to us uh, growing up with nonprofits where there were always these like vague kind of let's go, you know, lobby for peace somewhere far away. And there was never really clear uh, goals. Mm -hmm. And I think realizing that on this trip and talking with all of these, you know, these college students, I think that that really helped plant this idea of a, of a you know, a social enterprise business model that we could, we could build that could also have that same tangible uh, effect. So where's the name Good Spread come from? So. Well, well. First, what? first, we have to tell you what the original name was. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yeah, the original, is... the the working, the working title was "This is nuts" with an exclamation point. <laughs> That's okay. That's um, good. I like it. I love but, it. But what it came down to is, like, what if you, what if you're, you know, you're with your spouse and and he or she is going to the store and you want "This is nuts." Do you yell to them, "Hey"? Grab some. This is nuts. It just it just felt so stupid. We were it's a, like, it's a bit we, like I can't gotta, believe it's not butter. Yeah, but, it just it can't work. Mm. We're, we're holding on to that name though. So yeah, Mark, Mark Moore actually played a big role in, in in that creation. So we're it'll 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 make its it'll make its return one day. It's, yeah, don't don't get me wrong. We own the copyright. But, good, good. It's <laughs> yeah. too good. It's too good. Um, <laughs> so actually, one of one of Mark's close friends, we were all at a concert together, and we were just discussing. Um, we, we had sort of started getting things off the ground. We were discussing the name, how that was a really big sticking point for us that we haven't, hadn't solved. Hmm. And he suggested that we just call it spread because then we could attach a lot of, hmm. um, kind of campaign or messages to spread, like spread good, spread mm -hmm. love, spread mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. Um, and it could fit into a lot of different settings than just food and nut butter specifically. So um, we pitched that to um, some guys we were working with on the design, and they came back at us a week, like a week later and said, well, instead of trying to own an entire category of spreads, um, let's call it good spread because, you know, you can spread disease and you can spread other things. <laughs> so we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll qualify that and say good spread. And 
and it just stuck. We everybody nobody disagreed with it, and most everyone was for it. So it reminds me too of what Mark was saying earlier about when you guys were in the Winnebago that you felt like you were spreading good news. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, right. We really like the idea of, of you know, spread as a, as a verb. It's, you know, it's an action. It's, it, it can, and it, of course it's also a noun as in our spread, but, um, we really like that idea of, of, of action. So you can, you can spread things and you're spreading good when you eat our peanut butter and, you know, our kind of our hashtag and our website is all based around this concept of help good spread. Because like Alex said, you know, we kind of all have a decision every day you know, we're all spreading something, you know, you're either spreading negativity, selfishness, uh, you know, or you can, you know, hold the door open for someone or offer your hand to help somewhere else and you can help good spread. And that's something to us that's really attractive. And we, we especially like the idea that all we're asking you to do in this model that we built is just eat peanut butter. It's like, it's the easiest way. And, and, you know, a, a very, uh, and to me, it's a fun way to help good spread is like, just oh, I'll, if I just eat this peanut butter, um, I can help help good spread. So it's a pretty easy ask. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess un- unless you're allergic to peanuts, then then you're really going you're really going out of your way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the peanut butter itself is not the same as the manner you were distributing. It's a little bit Correct. different, isn't it? The good spread. Good spread is actually just peanut butter and honey. So, um, so whose idea the- was that putting honey in peanut butter? We were peanut butter gods. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) well, we we went to the factory and it was kind of like wine tasting, but a little less refined. Um, (laughs) There were these, there were these like little cups of peanut butter and there was just plain peanut butter with variations of salt ranging up through different kinds of peanut butter with, there was one with banana flavor. There was Mm. all up through honey. Like the sound of that. Yeah. Yeah. That may be something for the future, but this is not what we, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, huh? it was totally nuts. This is bananas. <laughs> <laughs> this is bananas. Right, get that, yeah. write that down, Mike. That's another copy. That copy, right, write that down. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so we just kind of went through and we'd taste some and we'd rinse our mouth out, taste the next one. And there was one that we all really gravitated toward and, toward, and it was just um, a natural peanut butter with organic honey. And we liked that simplicity. Mm. Um, we, we wanted to start out simple, but we knew we didn't want to start out plain. Mm-hmm. So mm. we went with the peanut butter and honey. I can't so. imagine how that tastes. Uh, I mean, as a British person, I consider peanut butter uh, like a savory thing anyway. I realize mm-hmm. I'm the only British here amongst kind of yeah, three Americans who all grew up on I'm a PB huge and J. Fan of peanut butter and honey. <laughs> peanut butter, um, honey, and banana. Actually, yeah, the trio. Right. Um, but I'm just intrigued. I mean, I'm just, I'd love to get you guys to, if you can, describe how it tastes. It's like, it's like heaven and a, a Sunday afternoon and... Um, walking <laughs> by the beach and uh, and, and listening to Peter Cetera. <laughs> yeah, just, ah, right. the, I mean, probably you probably couldn't sum it up better than that. I, I think I'm there. I, I, I feel right. like most people, specifically with our with our our recipe, most people can say that they can taste the honey, mm-hmm. but it's not a it's not an incredibly overpowering. Peter, like it's okay. you, you're getting the saltiness of the of the peanut butter of the natural peanut butter taste, and it's just a hint of this. Mm. Um, it, it makes it a little bit sweeter, mm. um, but it's much better. It's a much better alternative than just dumping sugar in. Yes, <laughs> to yeah. sweeten it up. It's using the honey kind of as a natural sweetener. So you're walking right. on that beach, and you've got the uh, exactly. uh, Peter <laughs> and it's the, the salty in the sea spray. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, like exactly. it. Nice. Yeah. No, it's painting a picture in my mind. We're gonna send you guys some. We'll, send, oh, good. we'll load you up. So yeah. we're you'll in. Be able yeah. to taste it for yourself. The good. whole time we've been uh, reading about you guys, I've just been, I've been, I guess, hungry to, to try it. I just can't <laughs> wait to get my hands on some. That's the goal. Pizza, yeah. good cause. Yeah. Do you feel like there's competition that you guys have, and is that a good thing or? That's. I mean, that's, that's, I would debate. Say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would just say that there, you know, we haven't seen, you know, in more recent years, we've seen more um, of this idea of social enterprises around food and connecting food with the rest of the world and even other companies that are donating packets of RETF or therapeutic peanut butter um, with sales of their food products. And to us, I mean, maybe this is this is ignorant, but we think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Like we we would that's we don't count that as competition. It's like the more people that are getting more RETF to kids in need, the better. So we think that's great. And if competition helps those companies grow more, then that's better. 
Um, we're kind of trying to keep our blinders on, I would say right now, and, and just really connect to our customers with a great product that's natural and delicious and easy to use with, with a really good story and mission that helps people around the world. So that was part one of our talk with Alex and Mark of Good Spread. Next week in part two, published on Wednesday, Alex and Mark share their crowdfunding tips and recommendations on running a startup. Our big thanks to them for their time and insights. Be sure and check them out at helpgoodspread.com. And be sure and return for part two. Subscribe to the podcast at iTunes or any podcast app so you can be sure of catching it. Our thanks too to our friend Chris Day for his thoughts. On Twitter, he can be found at wordbeard. Meantime, we're on Twitter at Crowd Scene Show. You can follow us there to keep up with guest news and get crowdfunding tips. We're also on Facebook at Crowd Scene Show. If you'd like to support the show, writing a review on iTunes is a much appreciated move and helps us reach more listeners. Go to the Crowd Scene page on iTunes, hit the review button, and it just takes a minute. As always, Pete and I want to thank Kim Bookbinder for her fantastic theme music. For more on Kim, do go to kimbookbinder.com. So until next time, this is Michael Ogden and Peter Dean saying thanks for listening. Michael Epic.